good morning, everybody. So who, who was here an hour early? <laughs> I had a momentary panic on the car coming over. So I hadn't changed my car clock. And I thought, oh, no, am I never late? <laughs> well, it's good to be with you again. It seems a long, long time. What's happened in between? What's going on? COVID. You know? Some pandemic or something, I don't know. But it's good to be with you this morning and uh, to just to be shared with you. And uh, thank you, musician, for playing so well. I really enjoyed that. Some old hymns I haven't sung for a while. And can it be? I haven't sung that for a while. But it's tremendous. Thank you. Um, yeah, we're going through the uh, book of Romans. Well, two verses in Romans at the moment. So we're going to have a look at that in a second. Um, but I thought it might be useful just to set a context for what we're looking at. I don't know whether you've done this or you just, just dive straight into the verses. But... Um, um, this chapter of Romans, um, I want to just have a high level view of it first of all, and then just dry, go down and down and down into the detail. So in the book of Romans, I don't know if you've read that book, it's an amazing letter that Paul wrote to the church at Rome. Uh, chapters 1 to 11 of Romans, Paul sets out to the Roman church the whole plan of salvation and growth in Christian character. And uh, in chapter 12, which we've been looking at this morning, um, it's a bit of a hinge point in the letter. Okay, Paul changes from expanding about theology and the truths of the gospel and doctrine. And he starts to look at how that doctrine can be worked out in our lives. And Paul does that in nearly all of his letters that he ever writes. He, he sets out who we are in Christ at the beginning of his letter, and then he goes, now you know all that, this is what you do. Okay? And effectively, that's what he's doing now in chapters 12 and 13 of, of Romans. Okay? And uh, it affects us as followers of Christ. The, the title of this series, I think, is called How to Behave as a Christian. Okay? Um, and Paul sort of sets out in Romans chapter 12 and 13 the truth of what that means to us. Okay? And it's about our relationships, effectively. All right? um, in, in chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, this is kind of the basis or the foundation of our behaviour as Christians, as followers of Christ, and believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about our relationship with God. Okay? And Paul talks about us consecrating our bodies and renewing our minds. So devoting our bodies to service and changing the way we think. And you'll know these verses, this is a New Living Translation, so it might be different to your version, but Paul says this in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is your, and there's various versions of this, this is your spiritual worship, or this is your reasonable service, or this is truly the way to worship him. So if you want to worship God in all your being, give your body to him and renew your mind. Then Paul carries on, he goes, don't copy the behaviour and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. God is not into patching you up or giving you a bit of a refurbishment or a bit of an external makeover. God wants to transform you completely okay, into a new person. That's what it says. Corinthians tells us we are new creations in him. Okay? You're not a patch-up job. All right? You might feel like that on the outside, I need some renovation. But within your spirit, you have been made new. You're a new person. You're a new creation. Okay? And that is what Paul is saying here. Now, just to just pick up some things, some key things here. He goes, some version says, therefore, okay, at the beginning of verse 1. Or this version says, and so. And basically, what's Paul saying? Of chapters 1 to 11, because of all of that, we come to this crunch point. Therefore, because of what I've explained before, this is important. He says, because of the mercies of God, because of all that God has done for you. So we need to grab hold of this understanding, okay? 
of how God has, hasn't punished us as we deserve. He's given us his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He has made us right with him. Okay? And we've been born into God's family. So this morning, he refers to them as brothers and sisters. We are brothers and sisters this morning. We are part of God's family. Okay? You've been born again into the family of God, if you know him. Then he says, give, give your body. It's a willing offering, okay? Nobody's strong-arming you. Nobody's putting your arm behind your back and saying, you've got to give your life to Jesus. This is a voluntary, willful thing that we do. We have to make that decision to do. We have to give our bodies to God's service. It's not some mystical thing, okay? This is down-to-earth stuff, okay? So when you go to work tomorrow, or you go to school tomorrow, you go to college tomorrow, you're in your neighbourhood you're devoting yourself to the service of God in that location. You are Jesus, if you like. Jesus' hands and feet, his voice, his eyes in that situation. You are there to witness for God. That is down to earth stuff. It's not some mystical thing up here. This is real life. Touchy, touchy stuff. And he goes, Paul goes, this is your spiritual worship, your reasonable service. It's reasonable or rational. It's the only sensible thing to do. It's the only logical thing to do. Because of all that God has done for you, this should be your response. It all makes sense in Paul's eyes. And then he goes, we are to become a living and a holy sacrifice. You, you can't be a partial sacrifice. Okay? You can't be a half in and half out. There's a story about a pig and a chicken walking down the road together. And as they walked along the road... They read a sign advertising about a breakfast to benefit the poor people in their area. And the chicken said to the pig, you and I should donate a bacon and egg breakfast. And the pig replied, not so fast. For, for you, it's just a contribution, the egg. But for me, it's a total commitment. Okay? There's no way out. You can't be a partial sacrifice. Okay? It's all in or nothing. The pig understood that. The chicken didn't. Verse 2 is a well-known verse. Don't copy the behaviours and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Okay. J.B. Phillips wrote in his paraphrase of this, he says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mould, but let God remould your minds. You remember those bunnies you used to get as a kid? Some of you were probably too young to remember this. Some of you will know it well. Remember Blamange? Who eats Blamange now? I mean, that pink, pink stuff. And it was all, my aunt used to put it in a rabbit mould. And you go for tea on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon, and there was this pink rabbit. What is that? It's a Blamange. What's a Blamange? Everybody's looking at me blank. Anybody over sort of under 30, what's up with the munch? <clears throat> jelly, okay? Remember jelly as well. You'd have a, you'd have a red rabbit and a pink rabbit. Um, the munch. But it was a mould, wasn't it? You, the jelly was squeezed into that mould. Okay? And the world wants to put you into its mould. All right. And, and Paul is saying, don't let it do that. Okay? <clears throat> How does the world do that? Well, 1 John chapter 2 says this. Verse 15 to 17, do not love the world or the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Okay? So there's immediately a, it's coming together, there's a clash here. Okay? If you love the world, you're not loving God, you're not the Father. For the world offers you only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father but are from the world. And this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Okay. So we, we live in that world, don't we? we you know, we're in it. And you know that we get distracted. The world will seek to, to make us think certain things and to behave in certain ways and to have certain values, okay, which are often, well not, they are contrary to God's values, God's way of thinking and God's way that he wants us to live. So Paul, uh, John says there, don't love the world, its cravings and lust, its gratifications, sex, luxuries, possessions, expensive food, whatever. Okay? Don't let that become part of your 
your whole reason for living. The lust of the eyes, greed and covetousness. The boasting pride in our possessions, our position, our arrogance. And you only have to look at the politics of our country at the moment and you see this arrogance and this hubris that people have. So the world's view is, is in complete contrast to God's view. Okay? It's on a collision course. And Paul, says, uh, Paul tells us to be transformed. Okay? And that isn't just a one-off thing. The tense he uses in that expression is continue to let yourself be transformed. Okay? It's an ongoing process. You know that. You don't, be, you don't get saved one day and suddenly you're a superhero, zero to hero you know you still sin, you still do wrong things, you still think wrong things, you still say things that are wrong. Your motivations are not right. So, we, But it's opening ourselves up to the Holy Spirit to allow him to change us and to produce the fruit of him, his spirit, in our lives. Okay. We can't do it on our own. So do you want to change and grow to be more like Christ? To behave like a follower of Christ? as a Christian, as we call it, then we need to change the way we think. We need to start listening to what God's word says and not what Satan says, which is all lies. Um, they used to say the expression, how do you know a politician's um, lying? He's opening his mouth. <laughs> yeah, okay. um, that's how Satan operates. He's the father of lies. He's been a liar from the beginning, Jesus said. And so we so easily listen to the subtleties of that. And Paul says, don't do that. You've got to renew your thinking to the truth of the gospel, to the truth of God's word. And this is a common thing, a common theme in Paul's letters. So it's a process, isn't it? Renew your mind by the word and the spirit. Then we can discern God's will, this transformation in our lives as we do those things. So verses 1 and 2 are the basis for this change in behaviour, how to behave like a Christian. We've got to kind of get that right, first of all. Okay? And Paul moves through the chapter, and as he works down the chapter, he looks at various relationships. We're not going to cover the second relationship, which was all about... Our, not, uh, the first relationship is with God. Okay, give yourselves to him. The second part, just below that, verse 2, is about our relationship with ourselves. In other words, look at ourselves in a right way. Think soberly about yourself. Get a right perspective about yourself. And then the third relationship, which is where we're going to look at now, is our relationship to one another within the family of God. Okay, Love in the family of God. And these are the verses which we're going to look at. this morning. So Romans chapter 12, verse 9 to 13. We'll read that, which is part of the block of verses that you've been looking at over the last few weeks, or will do. It says this, Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honouring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Or there's two other versions. Never be lazy, but serve the Lord with a zealous spirit. Or never be lazy, but let the spirit excite you as you serve the Lord. And we're going to think about that in a minute. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. So that's what we'll be thinking. That's what you'll be thinking about. So this love that Paul is talking about here is not a fatherly love or a family love. It's an agape love. The word agape means God's type of love. Okay. An agape love is a sacrificial love. Remember the, the pig? Okay. This is about the love that lays its life down to serve the people. It's the love that Jesus has for his church, for his world. Okay. And Romans chapter 5, if you read it back, verse 5, says God has poured out his love into our hearts. So that when we get saved, God has put that love into your heart. Okay. That type of love. It's a sacrificial love. And love is to shape our relationships. Now, as you read down these, these appear to be quite random instructions, don't they? It's like Paul's thinking, what should we talk about? Oh, yeah, we need to, we need to not pretend to love each other. We really need to love each other. Well, we've got to be affectionate. We've got to work hard. 
But there are kind of eight ingredients in this little passage which you've read, which help with that recipe of love. And let's just, just touch on them very quickly. First of all, sincerity. Love people sincerely. Okay? Don't pretend to love them. It should be without hypocrisy. It's not play acting. It's got to be sincere. Okay. We've got to have discernment. Verse 9. Love each other. Take delight in each other. Oh, sorry. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Okay. So hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Love is not blind, as we say. It's discerning. Okay. He's got his eyes open to what's going on. Verse 10. We have to be affectionate. Love each other with genuine affection. Okay. Devoted in brotherly love. As part of God's family, we have blood relationship. And the blood is the blood of Christ. Okay. We've been born into the family of God. And it's his blood that enables us to come into the presence of God, holy and blameless, Colossians tells us. Which is an amazing thing to try and get your head around. Okay. And then we're to honour each other, to respect and honour one another, not backbite or undermine or disrespect. And then we're to be zealous and fervent in spirit, as we're going to look at in a second in a bit more detail. We're to be patient. Patient, the centre of patience is hope, the confident expectation of Christ's return and the glory to follow. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. Generosity. We're to give generously. If we see people in need, address it. Don't just say, I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> if they need something practical, just do something about it if you can. Okay, in a practical sense, that's what love being outworked here is. And show hospitality to each other. When we are moved by what God has done for us, okay, when our minds have been renewed, to grasp his will, our relationships become transformed. Okay. Not only do we offer our bodies to God and develop a, a real image of ourselves, but we love one another within the family of God. Okay. So let's just have a look at fervent in spirit, verse 11. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Serve the Lord with a zealous spirit. Let, God, let the spirit excite you as you serve the Lord. Okay, that's what we're going to think about briefly now. When Paul tells the Christians to be fervent in spirit, it means that their lives should demonstrate a vibrant presence of the Holy Spirit. The word he uses is zealous. Okay? We use the word zeal. And I don't know if I've ever met any, I don't know if I've ever used that word in conversation. <laughs> probably not. It's an unusual word, which is probably dropped out of fashion. But the word zealous in Greek indicates it's like boiling water on a fire. Okay. It's like a pot boiling. You know, when, you, when, when a pot's boiling, you just put, put your, when you're boiling your eggs, okay? <clears throat> Back to eggs and bacon again. I was just got this thing about eggs and bacon this morning. You put your boiled egg in, it's really bubbling away, isn't it? The steam's coming off it. They call it roiling. The, ball, the, the, the water bubbles over, it gets off steam and heat. It's agitated, isn't it? It's not stagnant, it's not idle, it's not apathetic. It's bubbling away. Okay. And that's the word when he says, um, be fervent in spirit. That's what he's saying to us uh, here. And Paul wants the believers to use their spiritual energy, their excitement and devotion in ministering uh, to others as they serve the Lord. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and he said, even as they face severe opposition, he says this to them. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Okay? Never useless, if it's for God. And our calling to holiness demands that we are passionate about purity, about love, with sincerity, and to serve God with our whole hearts. Okay, we need to be zealous for that. Okay, we need to be zealous for that. Now, interesting, we always think of zealous being busy, 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 you know, active and active. But actually, sometimes we need to be zealous for the other things of God, for prayer, for reading the word of God. Okay, now though that is a good thing to be zealous about, isn't it? Okay, 
Paul tells us in verse 12 is that they should pray in, when they're in times of trouble with fervent prayer. Okay. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. Zeal at times demands adrenaline. Okay, we're really into this. But it also demands sometimes that we slow down and we prioritise the spiritual over the activity, if you like. Remember Mary and Martha? Martha was busy, busy, busy. Mary comes and sits at the feet of Jesus and she says he's, she's chosen the better part. Okay. She was zealous for Jesus. She wanted to be in his presence. Okay. Because that then energised her to go out and serve. Okay. We come and we rest. Ephesians talks about that. We sit in the high, high places of heaven. Okay. We get energised and then we stand. You've got to come back to that point of resting in Jesus. Taking from him. Hear listening to him and be zealous about that. Okay. How many of us find prayer difficult and tough? Okay. We fall asleep. We get distracted. We stay in bed that extra hour. Okay. Other things come in. The TV's on. Okay. We don't make a priority for it. And then we wonder, and I'm talking to myself here, why thing, we, we don't listen to God, we don't see things happening. It's because we're not spending that time on our knees praying to him and spending that time and being zealous for that in our lives. Okay. Zealous, zeal needs to be focused as well. There are a number of passages in the, in the, in the Bible that refer to being fervent and zealous for God. And they point to this zeal being focused and grounded on the truth of God's word. Um, Apollos, the same, this same expression, fervent in spirit, is used in Acts uh, chapter 18. And it says this about the, the ministry of Apollos. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. Okay, so he, he knew about Jesus, but he hadn't come into that experience of a relationship with, with, with Jesus. He only knew about John. And it says then that, the, that uh, Priscilla and Aquila instructed him. And then he, he came to understand where he was going wrong, or he knew what he had to do. And he was zealous and knowledgeable. Okay, it wasn't just some enthusiasm, okay, without any substance, emotionalism. It was grounded in the word of God. And this is what I was saying in verse 1 and 2 of this letter. When we start to change our thinking, when we start to see things from the perspective that God sees things, that spurs us on to serve him. So, godly zeal must be tempered with a solid foundation in biblical truth, in discernment and spiritual perception. And Paul talks in Romans chapter 10, verse 1 to 4, how our zeal can be misplaced. It says the Jews were full of what Paul described as misplaced zeal in following the law. They were all out for the law, but they were going down the wrong path. Okay? They hadn't got it about the grace of Jesus, the grace of God. So we, can, we need to be careful that our zeal is not misguided. And then Paul mentions Titus and many other believers who were fervent in spirit with hearts eager to do good and serve God with enthusiasm. And Peter describes those who are fervent in spirit as having an eagerness to turn from evil and do good and to seek peace and pursue it. 1 Peter chapter 3. Only by God's grace and his spirit working in us can we develop this spiritual zeal okay, that enables us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live a self-controlled, upright and godly life. In this present age. In Titus chapter 2 it says this. Verse 11 to 14. For the grace of God has been revealed. Bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this world, evil world with wisdom, righteousness and devotion to God. While we look forward with hope to that wonderful day. When the glory of our great God and saviour Jesus Christ will be revealed. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and to make us his very own people, totally committed, totally zealous to doing good deeds. Perhaps this morning you're aware of lethargy. Perhaps you're feeling apathetic. 
Perhaps you're just lacking energy in serving God and others. The zeal of bubbling water within you has grown cold. It's gone placid. Okay. So what can we do, then, very quickly, to rekindle that drive to serve God and pursue righteousness? Well, first off, I guess if we're in that position, and I myself included, we need to come to God and ask for, for his forgiveness and just acknowledge it, okay, for what it is, our apathy, our laziness, our lack of zeal, our lack of enthusiasm to pursue righteousness and godliness. It starts there, doesn't it? If we want to get serious with God, we've got to come to that point and say, Lord, I'm sorry for this. Second thing we've got to do, we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus, okay? Hebrews 12 tells us this so if you're lacking that enthusiasm think about him therefore since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith let us strip off every weight that slows us down especially that the sin that so easily trips us up and let us run with endurance the race god has set before us we do this by keeping our eyes on jesus the champion who initiates and perfects our faith or the author and perfecter of our faith because of the joy awaiting him he endured the cross disregarding its shame now he is seated in the place of honor beside god's throne think think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people then you won't become weary and give up after all you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin Think of what Jesus has done for you when you get lethargic and let that spur you on. Keep your eyes fixed on him. Run the race with endurance. So we need to repent. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. We can pray about it. Tell Jesus about it. Okay? Ask him for his power, his grace, his spirit to breathe oxygen onto the embers of, your, of the zeal in your life. Fan the flame the, of the gifts within you. Paul says to Timothy, this is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power and love and self-discipline. If you flag in, if you're feeling low, Lord, reignite the embers within my heart so that I can have that enthusiasm and that zeal. We can ask for and nurture the gifts of the spirit to build up the church and ask for the fruit of his spirit to be evident in our lives lord and we need the spiritual gifts within our church so that we can serve the church and see it grow and we can minister to each other please help me with that what what are the gifts that you have that you can use within this church what opportunities are there to serve within apec here okay there's loads of stuff going on just listen to the notices Okay, what can you do in those situations to, to energise you? Okay. Another thing we can do to energise us and get our zeal back is to look at what God is doing. Um, we've heard about Paul in Moldova this morning. And I'm on the sort of WhatsApp group for that. And it'll blow your socks off. You hear what God has been doing in Moldova uh, this last week while Paul and Bob have been over there amazing things of people getting saved and that should energize us that should excite us okay you know amazing testimony that, that they'll paul will come back i'm sure and share with you as a church come and listen to what god has been doing through paul in his ministry there his testimony and his and his talks that he's given because that should excite you i think yeah i want to i want a bit of that <laughs> i want to be part of that and then, just to finish off, we go back to the verses we thought about at the start of our talk this morning. Romans uh, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behaviour and customs of this world world but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think then you will learn to know God's will for you which is good and pleasing and perfect present our bodies in worship and service it's a sacrifice it's tough okay but let's not get caught up in the world's values but allow God to transform us by the changing 
the way we think. As we start to see the world, the church, the people, eternity, the way that God does. That will keep us fervent in spirit because God has a part for us to play, a purpose within that. Okay. I'm going to finish there. Um, I think we're going to have another hymn now. Mr. Musician, thank you. Um, we're going to sing one.